All right, let's continue with the para duma. The para duma is the red heifer. What's known as the red heifer in the Hebrew. Now, consulting with our Hebrew book of Numbers, let's just go over this. And we went through the entire chapter, and we concluded with Revelation chapter 22 on the message of let he who is unclean or he who is unjust be unjust, he that is filthy be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy be holy still. So we have to recognize um, John's um, free will and the free will that he has given to all. You understand? And seek to make our wills obedient to his good influences and, and to the instruction, you understand, of his son through Yeshua HaMoshiach, right? Now, so here, God, Jah, he told Moses and Aaron to instruct the Israelites in what's known as the ritual, the ritual law of the red heifer or the para aduma in the Hebrew, right? Used to create water of what's known as lustration. The water of lustration, Numbers 19, verses 1 to 2. Now, the, the heifer, and what is a heifer? A heifer is a cow that has not yet born any calf. So the calf, when we say the golden calf, when we speak about the golden calf, the golden calf is the, the baby, in that sense, of the heifer. Now, this is very interesting when we, we could look at, we look at Judaism right here. But, of course, there's a Christian Christological sense in and through the Moshiach that we're about to touch on, which is the footnote for the Red Heifer Water of Separation, Numbers chapter 19 here in our Schofield reference, right? But also in Islam. In Islam, they have a surah. It's called Suratul uh, Bukra. I think Bukra, and it's called the Surah of the Calf. The surah of the cow, some say the cow, some say the heifer, the surah of the heifer, right? So this red heifer, now the key is it has to be red, you understand, this red heifer. So a uh, heifer is a cow, is not a cow, once a cow has born or given birth, it is no longer a heifer in that sense. So let's, let's just overstand that. Many of us may be citified in the city and we, we only maybe know... Old McDonald, Old McDonald had a farm or something like that from, you know, the, the nursery rhyme. But in the in, in understanding this right here, we have to recognize what is what. So a heifer is not just a cow, but specifically it's a cow that has not given birth to any calf. It had to be without blemish. It had to have no defect. It had to not have borne a yoke. That means it has not, um, according to um, King James, and which never came, and upon which never came a yoke, right? A yoke. Think about when Yeshua says, "Take my yoke upon you." So the idea was coming from the agricultural world. That agricultural sense is is very clear and evident. So city folks might miss it. You understand? So this is why we have to be born again. This is what we have to study and show us with the proof so we can see how Jah wants us to see it and not from our mixed up moods, attitudes, or Gentile, white, Western world confusion of it. Now, Numbers chapter 19, verse 2 says, Eleazar, the, the priest, was to take it outside the camp, observe its slaughter, and to take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times in the direction towards the tabernacle, towards the dinquan, right, or the mishkan. Now that's Numbers chapter 19, verses 3 to 4. We're just reviewing right here. Now the, now the cow or the heifer, the cow that did not bear called the heifer, was to be burnt in its entirety, along with the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the crimson, or the scarlet stuff. Numbers chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. Now the priest and the one whom burnt the cow were to both wash their garments, bathe in water, and be unclean until the evening. 
Numbers chapter 19, verses 7 to 8. The ashes of the cow were to be used to create what's known as the water of lustration, which is the same as the water of separation in Numbers chapter 19, verses 9. One who touched the corpse of any human being was to be unclean for seven days, Numbers chapter 19, verses 10 to 11. On the third and seventh days, the person who had touched the corpse was to cleanse with the water of lustration and then be clean, Numbers chapter 19, verses 12. One who failed to do so would remain unclean and would defile the tabernacle and would be cut off from Israel, but, one, but that one soul be cut off. That's why when the Bible says not all who are of Israel are Israel, because there's a spiritual Israel. Here the soul is cut off from Israel. Numbers chapter 19, verses 12 to 13. When a person died in a tent, whoever entered the tent was to be unclean seven days, and every open vessel in the tent was to be unclean. In other words, it was contaminated. If it didn't have a covering or top on it, Numbers chapter 19, verses 14 to 15. In the open, anyone who touched a corpse, bone, or a grave would be unclean seven days, Numbers chapter 19, verses 16. Now, a person who was clean was to add fresh water to the ashes of the red cow, dip hyssop, hyssop or hyssop in the water, and sprinkle the water on the tent, the vessels, and the people who had become unclean, Numbers chapter 19, verses 17 to 18. The person who sprinkled the water was then to wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be clean at night for Numbers chapter 19, 19. Now, anyone who became unclean and failed to cleanse himself was to be cut off from the congregation, and once again, their soul, what is the soul? The nefs, or nefesh in the Hebrew, or nefs, bamarinya in the Ethiopic, the nefs is the mind, the nefs is... It, the nest is the feeling, the thought, the emotion, but also it's the will, their will. So when it says make our wills obedient to good influences, one who can't make their wills obedient to good influence, it's as though they were cut off. Just to, to give you an a, a, a operative idea of this, Numbers chapter 19, verse 20. The person who sprinkled the water of lustration, which is known as the water of separation, was to wash his clothes. And whoever touched the water of lustration, the water of separation, whatsoever he touched, and whosoever touched him were to be unclean until the even. And that concludes that chapter 19, verses 21 to 22. Now, immediately in chapter 20, the next chapter, we learn that the Israelites, the Beta Israel, they arrive at Kadesh, which is basically say Kedus, a, a holy place or a sanctuary in the wilderness of Zin, or Sin, and Miriam, Miriam died and was buried there, we have in Numbers chapter 20, verses, uh, verse 1. Now what's interesting, it says in the very next verse of this chapter, when you look in Numbers chapter 20, verse um Verse 1 and 2, let's just go through this right here. Numbers chapter 20, the years of wandering, the death of Miriam. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, to the desert of Zin. In the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, or Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Then the years of separation, the thirst in the old place of thirst, Exodus chapter 17, verse 1 to 2 is a, is, is a retrospect, but verse 2 says, And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. How interesting this is, we find this right here, that after Miriam's death, the second point of this Rastafari sabbatical study, number 39, Hukat, or Bamarinya, um, yeah, it says that Miriam, she dies, and there was no water. There was no water. So Miriam, the sister of Moses and Haron, she dies. And right after her death, the scripture now points out to us that there was no water. Can you go, hmm, that is interesting. 
that's very interesting there that Miriam, right, she dies. And the Torah, the scriptures here tells us that in the next verse it says, and there was no water for the congregation. And moreover, they gathered themselves together against Mashu, Musa, Moshe, and against Aaron or Haron, Aaron. This is very interesting. That, see, what we're learning right here is not just the psychology of Israel, but ideally the psychology of humanity, but in particular for us, the psychology of black people, of our black folks. You understand? Other people are like this too, but more so when you really study it and you put it in its proper context. We already show you on the overt level, even with, with, with the hand of Moses, Moses' hand, he puts it into his bosom, it comes out, and it's white, and it's, it's, it's leprous, it's white and everything, and then he puts it back in, and it turns back to his other flesh. I mean, what could be more obvious than that? And then we also have in chapter 12, when um, Aaron and Miriam, when they had spoke against uh, Mashu, Musa's Ethiopian wife, uh, Sipara or Zipporah, when, she, when they spoke against the little bird, uh, uh, Zipporah, Sipara is like a little, is like a small bird, but they spoke against Moses' wife. This is very interesting. His Ethiopian wife. Now, as we taught Previously, that was cultural. Some people would say, see, that proves that um, Moses' wife was an Ethiopian, uh, maybe black, but the uh, Israelites were white. No, no, well, how could that be if she's now cursed with leprosy, if you really know the whole thing about Hansen's disease, and we've touched on it previously, uh, you know, ad nauseum even to the point, you know, to really break down and really um, convince ourselves that truly European, the European, what we call white folks, come through that um, recessive genetic, some would call it a disorder. And this is scientifically known without getting into any, you know, any hate. There's no hate to this. This is just science. This is just reality. You know what I'm saying? So in the same way, the scripture is showing us that science and that reality. You know what I'm saying? That some folks don't like this science and the reality, what it's really showing, so they'll try to say that, well, the Bible is not real, the scripture is not real, because if you put it in its proper context, it is Afro-Shemitic, it is African, it is black. If you put the Bible in its right context, and it is also Egyptian. There's something very important about Egypt right here, and here's what we want to touch on Miriam's death. You understand? Know but before we go into Miriam's death in more detail, we're just going to, we're going to rewind for a moment and go to the red heifer, because there's a footnote there that we promised that we would touch on, and we want to touch on it too, because we want to make sure we, we keep this in its proper context right here. So let's go to the Schofield. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Schofield right here. And let's touch on um, the footnote down here in the Schofield, page 192. So the red heifer, the red heifer. Um, the cow is called the eg egal or the egla, agla, agla. And there's something interesting about this in, in our early days of studying, um, you know, studying about Ethiopia, the Bible, you know, we came across even some of the Masonic stuff out there. We came across this um, um, this right here, uh, A G L A. Now, in the Hebrew, right? In the Hebrew, let's see if we can put this right here. In the Hebrew, we have um, right here. Let's see if we can put the Hebrew right here. All right, and something something to that effect, right? We have Egla. Agla, -a, right? Agla. Now, some say this is the acronym for for Ata Gibor Lolem Adonai, in some Masonic teachings. Ata Gibor Lolem Adonai, and Ata means you, Gibor means strong, Lolem means eternal or perpetual Adonai in the forever 
in the forever master and the forever Lord, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. So some look at it to be an acronym in that way. Now the Agla or the Egla is actually the calf. The Hefa is the Para, Para Aduma. So don't think that we're saying that the red Hefa is the Agla, but what is the Agla or the Egla? The Agla or the Egla in the Hebrew is the calf. The Agla or the Egla is the calf. Now, what I did was I went to our Ethiopic Torah, right? The Ethiopic Torah right here, right? And you can see it right here, the Ethiopic Torah or the Orit, right? What's called the Octatech or the first eight books. They say the Pentateuch is the first five books from the Eurocentric Judaic perspective, but from the Ethiopic perspective, we call it the Octatech. And when we get to uh, chapter, um, let's see, which chapter is this? This will be chapter, chapter 19, right, in the Gutters, right, chapter 19. Now, we just, this is a retrospect on the Red Heifer where it says, and the Lord spake to Moses and to Aaron, saying, so this is from the Gutters right here, it says, um Yama Yam Yamitsa U Leke Ahate Ahate one and now this now goes into the next verse Ahate Igwelte Igwelte Eyahe Igwelte Eyahe Nits Nitsahite Inte Alabati La Eleha No Re no re wente ia te wede ye la eleha arout. Right? The key word here from this, from the good is, right? Because the good is verse 1 and verse, verse 1 and verse 2, is the word that it's using in the good is for red heifer. It uses the word igwelte, 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 igel. Agle is one and the same. This is actually the root of the Hebrew right here, the Ethiopic. Igwelte keyahe. Keyahe is like bamarinya ke. Ke means red, right? Ke means red. As we have the name of uh, Cain, um, Kayan, the Kayan, the, the red eye, Cain, Kayan, right? So we have Agla, Egla, right? Igwelte. Eyahe, Eyahe, the red heifer, right? So this is just to focus on that, that in the Hebrew, it specifies, in a sense, it specifies this one as a cow that did not give birth. But the link now with the calf, because the cow that hasn't given birth would be able over time to give birth. But now this particular cow, now notice this, this particular cow, right, that, 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 that did not bear any calf, is now to be, in a sense, a sacrificial ordinance for the purification, right, of one who, who had come in contact with the dead, right, of one who came in contact with the dead. So we have the water of separation, so forth and so on, being a water of lustration being connected with this. Now, remember I said that these three right here, these are the eight, the eight subject matters that's in this particular Torah portion, Chukat, Yehigutizaz, these eight and these three right here, the first three are connected, the red heifer, Miriam's death, and the water from a rock, which more correctly would be the water from the rock, which in truth, overstood, is Christ. Christ is that rock. Remember, at this particular point also, Mashu or Musa is going to find out, Moses and Aaron is going to find out that they will not be able to enter into the promised land. This is also a key right here. And it's because of what happens at this rock. 
You understand? What is done and what is not done. Remember what we said that a sin, a hot iat, means a missing of the mark. A sin is not just what you do. You understand? It could also be what you don't do. You understand? So let's recognize this from right here, that these three, the red heifer, Miriam's death, and the water from a rock, are all connected within the mishtia, the mystery, or as you might say, the mythology, you understand, the myth, the mystery, the parable of the scripture. Now, the footnote here is interesting, because when it says the red heifer, it says that this is a type. This is a type of sacrifice. Now, when you see type in the footnote of the Schofield, you need to understand type in the sense of, like, the hieroglyphs. When you see the hieroglyphs, they are all types. The hieroglyphs are not so much just letters, and, and, and the Europeans have been, have been finding this out as this new vid that we pointed out, pyramid code. Very, very interesting. But the Europeans have been finding out Many of our black brothers and other scientists, Sheikh Anta Diops and others who have, Dr. Ben and, and many others who have gone into this, have already told us the same things that we're seeing in these new history channel programs and other programs being told us now by Europeans and white people, and now people are beginning to believe it. But the good thing is that a lot of our brothers and sisters wrote down their inspiration so we can see that it's dated. We can see that, that, that we figured these things out, you understand, already. But now that we found this love of job, what are we doing with it? So what, one thing to find the truth, but how are we acting on it? And do we really receive it? You understand, wanting to know something, you understand, it's nothing to act on that knowledge, to acknowledge it. You understand, to incorporate that knowledge and gain the wisdom and understanding in order to get the overcoming. Now, the red half is a type. So this is a type. You understand, a type, like a hieroglyphic type. And it's interesting if we look at the Aleph, too, the Hebrew letter Aleph. Even if we look at the Ethiopic Aleph, and let us write the Ethiopic right here. The Ethiopic um, Aleph is somewhat like this, right? If you look at this carefully, some say that the Aleph is an oxen. It says the Aleph is an oxen. Alf, Alf, and Aleph, Aleph is an oxen. It's interesting if you look at this, this, this uh, Fidel here, this type here, I don't know if you can see the oxen in it. I don't know if you really can really understand the oxen in this particular you know, whether you see the bull, in a sense, not the BS as y'all might call it, you know what I'm saying, but if you can see that type there. So now the Schofield is telling us in the footnote that this is a type of the sacrifice of Christ. This is a type of the sacrifice of Moshiach, of the Moshiach, the Mashiach, the Christos, as the ground as the ground. I want you to pay careful attention to the words used right here. And Dek Amizah and disciples and brothers and sisters who really are studying with us, make notes of it. Just take some notes of this and it'll come together by and by and over time. The ground. Notice what it's saying. That this type is a type of the ground. What is the name of the red heifer in Hebrew? What's the name of the red heifer in Hebrew? The, the name of the red heifer in Hebrew is is para aduma is para is the para aduma is the para aduma the name of the red heifer in hebrew is the para aduma aduma adama is the earth in the hebrew the adama and sounds very much similar to adam you ever see like the red clay earth in like the west indies that uh, down south and, and, and country in Africa, you see that red, rich earth. You see how the Egyptians, you know, what I'm saying, also colored themselves with that red type. You understand, know and you can see it also in I and I. You understand, know you can see that same red type within I and I. We have we have what we call um, um, high yellow or red bone. We say red bone. Well, that's very high on the spectrum of red. You understand, know but the red type. It's connected with the ground. So now here we learn that it's a type of Christ's sacrifice or the sacrifice of Christ as the ground, as the ground to say the foundation, the ground of the cleansing 
of the mitmanon, of the one who have amen, true and faithful witness from the defilement that is contracted in his pilgrim walk, in the walk of pilgrimage. Remember the pilgrim feast? We spoke about that, the Shalosa Regalim, the Maheja, the pilgrim walk through this world. So we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So we are pilgrims in this world, and we're walking through this world. And now Christ becomes that ground, that foundation of the mitmanah from the defilement that is contracted. So you see, the defilement is not one that's going out there saying, well, let me defile myself. But there is defilement in this world. You know, you could be on the Internet, you could turn on the TV, and you see some stuff that you wish you didn't see. You know, and boom, you got defiled. Well, what do you do? Was it your fault? No, it wasn't your fault, but there must be some what cleansing. What is the cleansing of the mitmanah? You understand? We don't admit in that filth that we see or that we get in, you know, we get contaminated with in the world, but now how do we deny that, cast it off, repulse that, you understand, from ourselves? How do we cleanse ourselves? So the illustration is given here of the method now of his cleansing. This is interesting. This is the method of Moshiach's cleansing right here in the type of the red heifer. Well, how is that? How can it be that that is so? Well, the order. First thing, the order is this. Now, what's interesting is that of the seven, the seven books and the seven seals and the seven, um, it says wisdom builds a house, right, like on seven levels based on, based on that seven. And in this particular portion, we have the same seven. The first level is like the, it's like the Ethiopian flag. And we pointed this out, the Ethiopian flag has the first four of the seven. The red is that foundation. The red heifer is that groundation. It says the ground of cleansing, the Lion of Judah, has those three feet, symbolic of the triune God, on that groundation, on that foundation right there. And what's the next color, pray tell? Well, the next color is this orange. You understand? Or the lion, it should be that orange color right there, which is the next level of the spectral color. And what's the third color of the spectral? It is the yellow. You understand? And the fourth is the green. And then we have the blue. You understand? And then we have the, the, um, three, higher, the three higher colors. You understand? The three higher, the more cosmic colors. That's why it's not pictured here, because those colors are more cosmical colors. But the first level, Torah studies, it gives us that order. For disciples, that come as amor, it gives us that order. How do we know it gives us that order? Well, we're going to have to divide scripture by scripture. Let's go to Isaiah for a moment. Let's go to Isaiah. Come to Isaiah with me for a moment. You, um, I'd say put a, put a mark in the other place in the book, and let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah for a moment. Isaiah chapter, we're going to go to chapter 8, chapter 8, and we're going to look at two verses in chapter 8, verse 16, verse 16 and verse 20, it says, bind up the testimony, bind up the testimony, seal the law, seal Torah, Torah, right, among my disciples, Old Testament, my disciples, so the, the law is the foundation, is the order is the order. This is why Yeshua, the resurrected Yeshua, you understand, had to spend that time with his disciples, teaching them in those 40 or so days, teaching them the Torah, teaching them the Nabim or the Nabiyat, the prophets, teaching them the Tehillim or the Mesmura Dawi, teaching them the Psalms and teaching them of all of those things written in those books concerning himself, concerning the Bain Ha Elohim, concerning our black Lord and Savior Yeshua Ha Moshiach. That's the whole point of the book. 
You know what I'm That's the whole point of the book. Some folks don't like that, but that's, that's tough for them. That's the whole point of the book is our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, is God, the Son of God, the triune God. That's the whole point of the book. So right here it says to bind up the testimony. If you look in Revelation, it says, Blessed are those that keep the commandment, the, his commandments, because they will have a what? A right. They have a right. They have a right to access of the tree of life. So some folks are talking about Kabbalah, you know what I'm saying? But they might not have no right to Kabbalah, you know what I'm saying? They, can't, they don't have a right to the access of that tree of life or to enter in through the stargate to that city, you know what I'm saying? We gain that through Yeshua HaMoshiach, through faith in Yeshua HaMoshiach. And we are saved by what? That grace, that Hanna, you know what I'm saying? That grace of God. You know what I'm saying? That grace of God. Now, here we are to bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples, he says. Verse 20 says, to the law, to Torah, to the Torah, and to the testimony. That means to the Old Testament and to the New Testament in this time of Rastafari revelation. To the Old Testament, to the New Testament, and what does it say moreover? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they don't speak according to this word, it's they're unilluminated. They can't, you know, they can't give you no light. They're in darkness. If you follow them, it's like the blind leading the blind or the blind following the blind. If they do not go and speak according to this word, to the law, and to the testimony, to Old Testament, and to the New Testament so they can get the overstanding. You understand the overstanding. So we thought it was really important just to touch on that, speaking of the order, because the, the order is the first level. It's the order. Order, will, wisdom, righteousness, patience, love, mercy. You understand? Know order is first, and Torah is order. Once you get the order right, order, will. You understand? Know our wills to make our wills obedient to good influence. Order, um, order, will. What's that? Order, will. <laughs> well, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Order, will. Order, will. Oh, wow. What is it again? Order, will. Pray to I. Am I. Am I missing one before? Well, we know order is the foundation. Order is the foundation. 